So tonight's sermon, it's probably not going to be a very long sermon tonight, but I want to hit on just some real practical, it's going to be a real practical sermon for you. I'm not going to be going really in depth in doctrine like we do other times. I'm going to be using a, the doctrine of, of reprobates though as kind of the springboard to give you some practical uh, learning and practical lessons on, on why this is important, what we need to be doing, especially watching out for our kids. So the, the title of my sermon today, tonight, is Protecting Unstable Souls. We started in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Of course, the beginning of this passage starts off warning us and explaining to us that there's going to, you know, perilous times are coming. And I personally believe that we're in the beginning of these perilous times, referring to like in the end times. I think that the end is coming near, you know, obviously it's nearer every day, but within our generation, I would, I would imagine that Christ's return is going gonna, is gonna to happen. Now, I know a lot of people throughout history have thought the same thing, but we, not, nonetheless, right, whether it is or isn't, we need to be ready. Amen. And when we get plenty of warnings in Scripture, just, just hey, be ready. You know, don't, don't be, you know, they didn't sleep, sleep at night. He says, but you're children of light. Walk as children of light. And we need to be, you know, we don't want that day to come upon us as unawares. We want to be ready. We want to be watching. We need to take the warnings in Scripture seriously and apply them knowing that they're true. Not thinking that, well, maybe this is true. No, we know that this is true. And there are many times in Scripture where, especially in the New Testament, where we're being warned about wicked people. And we need to have this warning regularly because it's so foreign to most of us, if not all of us, that these people exist in the world. When you, when you live your life around people you love, people you know, Let's call, quote unquote, good people. Okay, people who are normal people. People who are not spending their time trying to figure out how they could do harm and do hurt to people. But you live in general around people that are similar to you. It's harder and harder to, to realize or to remember that no, there are really wicked people out there in this world. And we need to be vigilant and on guard against the wickedness in this world because the reprobates, the children of the devil, these really bad people, destroy lives. Amen. Destroy them. I mean, it, it's, it's enough to, you know, you hear the stories of what happens with kids and the defying. It's enough to bring you to tears when you just start thinking about how can a person even overcome the, the, the trauma the, the destruction that's been done and, and perpetrated against the, the most young, the most innocent. And you hear about kids' innocence being stolen and what so many people have had to go through. You don't want that to happen to your family. You don't want that to happen to your kids. And we need to remember that these people exist. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous means dangerous. It's dangerous times. It's a dangerous world that we live in. Now, I'm not standing up here trying to just fear monger and to get you all you know, scared and shaken. Oh, man, what are we going to do? We need to know this, though. The Bible is telling us that there's perilous times coming. This is information that we need to have so that we don't get lazy, we don't get flippant, and we don't just get, you know, just overly trusting right. with the people that matter the most to us. You have to understand that dangerous times are coming and are upon us and that there are people out there that are going to do some real, real bad things. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This is a long list 
of, of attributes of these wicked people that's very similar with Romans chapter 1 because it's the same group of people that this is talking about. Think about it. You're getting warned in Romans. You're getting warned in 2 Timothy. You're getting warned many places. We're going to look at a lot of Proverbs and Psalms. You know, these places that talk about wicked people, we are getting warned regularly in Scripture. The Apostle Paul says, you know, I've, uh, I've ceased not to warn you day and night with tears. What's he warning? He's warning about false prophets. He's warning about these wolves in sheep's clothing. Right. These really wicked people, bad people are out to destroy. Warning, warning, warning all throughout the Scripture of these people. Let's listen and take heed and not just realize that they're out there, but we need to make practical rules and decisions in our lives that are going to keep these people from doing damage to us. Now, as a pastor of the church, I'm going to try my best to, to watch over the flock and to try to keep these people at bay. But the Bible also tells us that they will be among us. And we have to be on guard for that, too. So uh, there's only so much any one person could do, because at the end of the day, some of these people you may be able to spot easily, but some of them are very, very slick. They're very sly. They, don't, they, they could get in under the radar, and they won't be exhibiting the behaviors that you might be on the lookout for, at least not right away, because they're in disguise. They're undercover. And you say, oh, Pastor Burzins, you're crazy. You're paranoid. Call me what you want, but I'm looking at, the, at what the Bible's talking about. And when you look at the 12 disciples, and one of them was a devil, one of them was a reprobate, one of them was out to damage and do harm and sow discord, one of them was out to destroy Jesus' ministry, and the other 11 disciples didn't even know who it was. And when questionable, when it, when it was brought to light, when Jesus says, hey, one of you is a devil, they all just said, is it I? Because they could not imagine any of the others being the one. They had that much faith and trust in everyone else. They're like, well, I know all these people. They would never do that. Is it me? I mean, would I do something like that? Judas got through. And no one really, I mean, Jesus, of course, knew. But no one else knew. And when you think about how much time the disciples spent with Jesus Christ learning directly from him for three and a half years. And even by the end of the ministry, they still didn't know. Don't make the false assumption that you'll just be able to spot all these reprobates no matter what. I can, you know, I can tell. I have the spirit of discernment and I'll be able to know whenever, look, look. Take heed. Now, here's, here's the good thing. If you institute proper rules within your household and in your life, you can make it and protect yourself from getting damaged by these people. You can put up a barrier enough to be able to, to not have these things really impact you. And, and just like I was talking about, I don't know, it was two weeks ago, you know, just making standards and having rules set in place, you know, trying to avoid adultery. Well, hey, if my wife and I, neither one of us are going and hanging out with someone of the opposite sex and going out to lunch and driving together, and, you know, and if, we're, if we're eliminating opportunities for a relationship to even begin with someone else, that's how you ward off adultery. And it's, a, it's just wise. It's a smart thing to do. Same thing when it comes to protecting your children. If you set up certain rules, and, and here's the thing, especially for those of us, uh, which is probably most of us in, in general, maybe not everybody. You know, I got saved when I was older in life. I grew up in a worldly home. Uh, many of you probably have a similar background or similar experience. It's easy, especially when you start to parent, to think like, oh, well, I did this as a kid, and I did that as a kid, and, I you know, and, and, and you don't really think much of it because it's something that you did. And maybe it's something that you did, and everything turned out okay, and you didn't have any problems with it, right? Well, thank God that nothing happened, but that doesn't mean that, that allowing your kids to do exactly everything that you did is a good idea. 
That doesn't make it a good idea. I made it through, you know, public school, and I, I was able to get some kind of an education, but that doesn't mean that I want my kids to go through public school. Now, look, if you do that, I'm not just trying to judge you, but I'm trying to come up with examples of, of, of you know, things that maybe you were part of that you wouldn't do for your kids now. I was allowed to go on, on sleepovers at friends' house when I was a boy. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to let my kids go to someone else's house. Some friend, this was a, you know, I went with friends from school, right? Go to school, we make buddies with someone, hang out. Now, I went and did this, and did anything happen to me? No. But you know what? We did get into trouble. We didn't have any booze in my house, but when I was going over to my friend's house, his parents had a, a, a liquor cabinet. His parents smoked cigarettes. His house had a lot more of the things that my house didn't have. And these were the opportunities that started introducing into my young life that were formative in some of the direction that I took later on in life. So yeah, I mean, you could say I'm alive and no one abused me, but it still had an impact later on down the road. Now, I th again, I thank God that nothing happened that would have, could have destroyed me. But you don't know. Even when you meet the parents, you don't know. Even if it's people from church, you don't know. Now, I don't know about you, but my kids are more precious to me. Just, just think of this illustration. Imagine you had a briefcase with $20 million in it. You got that? I mean, that's a lot of money. That's more money than I'll ever earn in my lifetime. Just all in one briefcase. Are you just going to be like, well, it'll be all right here. I'm just going to leave that there. You know, th think about how you would handle that. Anything precious, right? Gold bars, what, whatever. Whatever you could think of that's just going to be this real precious commodity. No, you're going to be like, man, I need to get a safe. I need to get a vault. I need to take steps to make sure that no one's going to steal this. That it's not going to get forgotten. That there's, you're going to have nothing that happen to this because, man, this is, this is valuable. Well, how much more precious is the life of your children, right? I mean, I mean how, how broken would you be if you ever were to find out that something that's, that, that your child was defiled? I mean, it's, it's, it's the worst for the kid, but I mean, I can't imagine a parent going through that. You're the one that's supposed to be watching out for them. You're the one supposed to be protecting them. And for you to think, man, on my watch, my child got defiled. I don't want to know what that feels like. I want to have no idea what that feels like to be the one responsible for the protection of my children and to have something like that happen to them that has psychological damage and impact on their mind for the rest of their lives. Trauma that just doesn't ever go away. I don't want to have that happen. And look, you, you, I'm not crazy. I'm not, I don't want to be this, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating for like this helicopter parenting where you're just always keeping your child in a bubble. Our children need to understand and need to grow and they need to experience, you know, some pain and, and getting hurt and the cuts and bruises and scrapes and sicknesses and things like that normal part of life. They need to be allowed to explore and do some things. But as a parent, you still need to be able to set boundaries. Right? So I don't, we don't want to keep them in bubbles. We're not trying to, we're not going to move the church and go start a compound somewhere and think that, oh, well, all these people are good people. We're going to put up our walls and, and there will be no contact with the outside world whatsoever. That's not what I'm advocating for. But at the same time, we need to have the restrictions on the kids. Because you don't know. And here's the thing, especially when it comes to church. I don't want, look, we don't need to have this attitude where you're on a witch hunt all the time and like, all right, where's Judas at? Where is he? Which one, which one of you is Judas? Okay, that's not the attitude to have, and I don't think that's the attitude you should have. 
but you don't have to have that attitude if you have the right rules in place. And when you're safeguarding your family and your children by having the proper rules in place, hey, kids, I want my, my kids all to have friends. They could do play dates. They could, they could have fun. They could do all this stuff. But why do they have to, you know, all sleep in the same room together? I don't see why. You could have nice kids that, that seem great, whatever, but may, maybe someone's gotten to them. And then they're going to do whatever to your kids, and they might not even understand what they're doing. But do you want that to happen to your kids? I don't. That's why I don't allow for these things. I, that's, that's one area I'm just, just drawing a line and saying that's not going to happen. Same thing with just leaving our kids with, with anybody. In my family, and look, these are, this is practicality. This is application of a principle. So you make up the rules that you want for your family. I'm going to just let you know some of my rules, not so that you copy everything that I do, but just to give you some type of idea how I apply my understanding of what this Bible's warning us about when it comes to predators. And then you can think about and decide what you think is appropriate for your house and your family. When it comes to my house and my family, the only people that we allow our children to spend time with out of our sight is our parents. Because we were raised by our parents. We know our parents. We know, you know, I mean, for, for all the years that we've grown up with them, we know them enough that we know we can trust them and, my, and our children will be safe with their grandparents. That's it. That's the whole list of the people that we're going to leave our kids with out of our sight. And that's where it stops. Brothers, sisters, nope. We get together, we hang out, we have fun. But how many people is it the uncle? Yep. Right? And it's sad. And, and look, does that mean I suspect my brothers of being, you know, reprobates? No. No, that's not what that means. I just, I don't know. I just don't want to even take a risk. It's not worth it for me. Now, again, you make up your own boundaries and your own rules, but this is important enough to think about and to have this assessment. You say, well, I don't even have any children, Pastor Rose, but you might one day. And this is not something you want to just kind of come up with on the fly. You ought to be thinking about these things. If you haven't thought about them already, start thinking about them. What am I going to do? How am I going to protect my children? Let's keep reading here through, I, I, I mean, I've got a bunch of verses, but let's finish 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 6. So the first five verses, we're, we're kind of getting all of these different attributes of these people in the last time, perilous time in the last days, perilous times will come, and all these people have no natural affection. They love themselves. They don't care about other people, they love themselves. So they love themselves, they're going to care about what they want, fulfilling their lusts, their desires, their covetous. They want things that they can't have. And then it says in verse 6, for of this sort, of this sort, of all, all the people have all these attributes just described here, are they which creep into houses. So are they being forthcoming about who they are if they're creeping? No, of course not. They're creeping in trying to get in and gain access. They're creeping into houses. They say, then lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. So they're appealing to, these, to the lusts of these silly women, not knowledgeable women, single women, I assume single women. Maybe they're not. I don't know. I mean, with these people, you can't put anything past them. But they're just, they're, they're using anything they can to appeal to get these women to follow them. So the women later sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a reprobate. That's someone that it doesn't matter how many times they look at the Bible, read the Bible, hear the Bible, hear preaching, they're never going to get it. They will never understand the Bible because the Bible is spiritually understood and that they are natural and they've been given over to reprobate mind they can never understand it. It doesn't matter how many hours they read and hear. 
it, they'll never get it. Verse number eight expresses this, calling them reprobates. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So right there, all, everything we're just reading about prior to that, it's referring to reprobates, people who are rejected of God. They have a motivation to creep in. And in this situation, they're leading the way captive silly women. Now, captive, notice that. They may entice these women to come follow them and, and appeal to their lusts, but what are they doing? They're putting them in bondage. They're making them captive to them and just controlling them and, and however these reprobates do it, you know. That is not good intentions. The Bible talks a lot about the wicked. So I'm going to read some verses for you from Psalms and Proverbs. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 4. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to read here from Psalm. Psalm 11, 5, the Bible says, The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Him that loveth violence. I mean, imagine, people love violating others. Because that's where the word violence comes from. It comes from violating someone else. When you are violating someone, you're committing violence against them. There are people that love that. These are the people that God hates, by the way, because that's what that verse says. But that alone is just, I mean, it's mind-boggling. There's people that just love violating others. Yeah, they exist. Psalm 28, 3. Draw me not away with the wicked. And with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors. So, oh yeah, they're, they're saying the, the, the good thing. Uh, you know, when they're talking to their neighbors, they're speaking peace. But mischief is in their hearts. They don't mean it. They're hypocrites. They're, they're trying to sound good to their neighbors. But in their hearts, it's mischief. They're just thinking about bad things. Even though, oh, hey, neighbor, how's it going? I, oh, I see you're growing a nice garden over there. And, just striking up a normal, friendly conversation, and in their heart, what you can't see is mischief. It's hard for us to understand. It's hard for me to understand. Like, I need to be reminded of this on a regular basis. Because when you have that conversation with your neighbor, you're not thinking anything like that. You actually are interested in what they're doing, and you hope you know, bless them, and, and I hope everything's fine with you. Not the wicked person, not a child of the devil, not a reprobate. That's not how they think. That's not how they operate. But they're deceitful. They'll make you think that they're normal, that they're fine, that they're loving. That's how they get in. That's how they're even able to try to get, you know, that's why they're doing it, is trying to get under the radar. If they just outwardly were acting like their heart is, then they'd be really easy to spot but they have to put on their mask. They have to put on their sheep outfit to not draw attention to themselves, to be able to gain access to whatever it is that their, the lust of their filthy heart desires to go in and destroy and devour. Proverbs 21.10, you're in Proverbs 4. Proverbs 21.10 says, The soul of the wicked desireth evil. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. Wicked person just desires evil. Again, loving violence, desiring evil. These are bad people and they exist. This is real. This is reality. Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse 14. The Bible says, Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. This is like a driving factor for these people to do hurt, to harm people. They're like, I can't even get a good night's sleep. You, know, you go out, you work a good full day, you're doing something good, you're going out soul winning, you're helping people and at the end of the day, you're like, man, whew, that was a good day, I'm exhausted, I'm going to get some nice rest now. These people... They're just like, man, I, I wasn't able to, to hurt anybody today. 
now that I'm not able to sleep, I'm going to be thinking about this all night. It was kind of a failure of a day because I wasn't able to hurt somebody. Right. It may not be easy to accept, but we have to look at the scripture and take it for what it says and believe it and receive this wisdom without having to come into it firsthand knowledge. You shouldn't have to have it happen to yourself or even happen to someone else to see, no, this is true. There are people that divide. I don't know if anyone's, I, man, I don't know all the details of this, but like, and, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's going to happen here. So whether it be, you know, people trying to attack your family, your children, or even just trying to get into the church and, and split the church and, and any time that there's good things happening for God, there's going to be bad people that are going to creep in to try to destroy it. Faith Forward Baptist Church has had lots of people trying to destroy the work that's being done there because they're doing so much work. There's a lot being done there. They're growing. They're reaching more and more people. So there's going to be constant attacks happening there. Recently, you know, there was someone sent a text message to like the wrong person in church. They're trying to talk with someone else. And it was literally like their plan. Hey, we're going we're gonna to try to, you know, talk to pastor about this and do it this way. And, you know, it was like this whole plan, like a diabolical scheme of trying to gain trust and what their plan was going to be to do damage. It was, all, it was like unbelievable seeing this, but this is reality. This is exactly what the scripture is talking about. These people are real. And again, I don't remember all the details of that, but I remember seeing it and I was just like, you know, we shouldn't be surprised, but it still is just kind of shocking to see they're just laying out this whole thing. Talking, to, you know, thinking they're talking to their partner in crime, right, to their other reprobate buddy of what they're going to do, and they sent it to the wrong person on accident. Scheming. The people are out there. Don't be surprised when it happens here, and don't fall for it. They're subtle. And that's, and, and again, man, I wish I could just remember all the details. If I would have, I, I just kind of popped into my mind. I didn't, I didn't prepare this for the sermon. But if I, could remember the, if I could remember the details of it, like what they were planning was subtle. What they were planning was trying to just take an event and like spin it and twist it to get people moving against them, right? I mean, it's just, that's what they'll do. They'll use these events. They'll use these things that happen to try to make it, it might have had something to do with the, with the Fannin thing or, or whatever. I don't remember. They had a Fannin thing. They like to use events like that where, one, there's not necessarily a lot of public information. It's not like everybody knows all the ins and outs of what's going on. Because when there's some level of unknown, then it's easier to, to turn people and say, oh, well, you know, and cause all, you know, raise all these questions and all this doubt for people who want to sow discord in churches, right? And try to make, you know, turn people against other people. That's one of the, one of the easiest ways to do it, one of the, one of the means they're going to use. Um, and that's what they were doing here. But the whole point that I was bringing up is that these people, like it says here in Proverbs 4, verse 16, they sleep not except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Verse 17, for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Flip over just probably one page, Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible reads, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart, he deviseth mischief continually, he soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. So, I mean, all of these people have an end. And it says, they're, like in this case, he shall be broken without remedy. Without, there's no fixing it. There's no cure. There's just, they're going to be broken and that's it. They're continuing right now for a season, but their day is coming and, and there is no, no fixing once they're broken with that. But it says here, look, they wink with the eyes. They speak with the feet. You know, they're going to use these methods to try to gain your uh, confidence or your trust. 
hey, hey, <laughs> give, you, give you a nice little wink, a nice little smile, a nod, you know, as they, as they speak with you trying to gain your confidence. I'm not saying that everybody who, who ever winks is, is, a, is a rubber So don't take me the wrong way. But this is something that, that you know, uh, people do to try to just gain your confidence. Okay, and this is, this is what the Bible is describing here. But in their heart, see, it's the outward man. What's in their heart, though, it's frowardness, they're wicked, they're devising mischief, and they're sowing discord. And that's what they're out to do. And, that's, and notice, in all these cases, it's talking about a wicked man. Do your own word study on that, on the wicked man, the wicked person. When the Bible is describing, I believe that 90% that of the time it's talking about a reprobate. The wicked man, wicked person. It doesn't mean that we can't do wicked things, right? Because all sin is wicked. Any believer can do something that's wicked, but you're not characterized as being a wicked man. Just like when the Bible refers to a righteous man, well, obviously we all have sin. It's not like anybody is just completely sinless. But when, when the Bible's making a distinction between like a child of God and a child of the devil, well, a child of God is righteous, a child of the devil is wicked. Right. And it's a real simple way to just categorize the righteous from the wicked. Lot was categorized as a righteous man. Do you think he wasn't involved in any wickedness as he's living in Sodom? I don't. I mean, I don't think he was a Sodom. Obviously, he wasn't a Sodomite, but, but was he living like the best Christian, you know, separated, sold out life? No, of course not. He wouldn't have even been living there if he were. But he's not categorized as a wicked man, as a wicked person, because the Bible is making that distinction. It's very consistent throughout Scripture. So um, there's obviously a lot more. I just wanted to draw a few of these uh, references just to how bad these people are, because the more you understand the, war the, the, the depth of how wicked people can be, the more you need to, to realize and, and when you see their, their, their MO, their modus operandi, when you see how they operate, that will help you to put the rules in place that you need to have in place. Because these people are deceptive. Turn, if you would, to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, right near the end of the Bible, right before the book of Revelation, you'll have the book of Jude. Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2 are parallel passages, but they come from different people. You know, Peter's writing the, second, the epistle of Peter. Jude's writing the, the, epistle, the general epistle of Jude. Obviously, they're both the word of God, but they're dealing, again, we're going to have like the same warnings coming from two different witnesses, two different people, and combine this with all the rest of the scripture that we've looked at. These false prophets or the false teacher, it's the same as the wicked man that we saw in Proverbs and Psalms. These are reprobates also, and we're going to get that clearly. Look at verse number 12 in the book of Jude. These are spots in your feasts of charity. So you have a feast of charity. A feast of what's charity? It's love and caring for other people, right? We're having a feast for other people. These are spots in your feast. Spots meaning, hey, this would be a great feast for everybody. It's a good thing that you're doing. But you've got this reprobate, this reprobate, that reprobate, you know, that are, that are here feasting with us or with you, right? It says, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, reprobate will never be in our church because there's enough hard preaching, there's enough railing on sin and just screaming about how these faggots are all going to die one day and burn in hell. They're never going to come in here. Well, the Bible says that they'll come in and they'll feed themselves without fear. That yes, they can't. Now, you know what? Some people, maybe they won't be able to stand it, but you're not going to get all of them out that way. You can't just rely on that. You can't just think because there's preaching going on about this that that's just going to keep all of them away. Because it won't. It doesn't. It may work for some, but it's not going to work for all. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. 
raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They're in dark and they're always going to be in darkness. And just, just think about the expanse of space and the darkness and it's just like they're just forever damned to darkness for the rest of their lives for the rest of eternity they rage they foam out their own shame i mean you see this again apply this to the to the lgbt a b c d e f g community or the alphabet, I, I, whoever coined that term was great, the alphabet animals. I think, I think that's really an appropriate term because they're trying to use every alphabet letter and, uh, and they're, they're dogs, they're animals. That's what the Bible calls them. But let's, uh, let's keep reading here. The Bible says in verse number 18, if you just jump down to verse number 18 there, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. So this ties in also with uh, where we started in 2 Timothy chapter 3, right? In the latter days. It says here there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own godly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And in the context here in the book of Jude, it's all about these false prophets. It's all about these reprobates. But the, what I want to point out and draw to your attention is verse number 19 where it says, These be they who separate themselves. Watch out for the people that want to separate themselves with one other person, or especially with the younger person. Oh, hey, I'll take your son to the ball game. I'll take your, you know, and they're just separating themselves. And watch out for the people that separate themselves. Look, even in church, even within the walls of the church. Now, we do our best with a family integrated church. You know, I remove doors where I think it's appropriate. I try not to have any areas that is going to make it possible for a young person to be defiled. Okay? And I think we do a pretty good job with that, but don't even just trust in that. What predators will do is they'll try to groom. They're targets. And it's not just it's not targets, it's targets. It, it's very common for the reprobate, for the predator. And think about think about them being a predator. What does a predator do? They're looking for prey. Think about any animal predator that there is. Are they only interested in just one animal? No, they're interested in any animal that they can get their hands on. Right? right? I mean the lion's looking for food wherever it's gonna get it. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be that one you know, baby pig or whatever that's going to feed it you know, just as prey. It's looking for as many as it could get. These wicked animal dogs, as the Bible refers to them, these predators, these reprobates are looking for your children to defile them. And it's not just one that they're after. It's, as, it's usually any that they could get their hands on. So they'll have in their grooming process people at different stages because they need to get their foot in the door. They need to gain trust. They need to gain confidence with the parents, with, you know, with the kids themselves. And they, they may keep making things go further and further and further to be able to establish what, you know, their wicked intents and to keep that going as long as they can and to, um, and to try to keep it under wraps. They don't want to be found out. So it's important, one, to have a good relationship with your children enough to have them come to you and tell you if anything, obviously if anything happens to them because what they're going to do is try to twist their mind around and to make them thinking that they're doing something bad, they're doing something wrong, you'll get in trouble if you say anything and really put the guilt on them and try to, and try to shame them and guilt them into not saying anything. And they're really good at that. And even parents that have good relationships with their kids, it's going to be hard for them to speak up about that if something happens because the, the predator is working on their mind to get them not to say anything. But um, So just be aware of that. Try to have as, as much of an open relationship as you can with your children and allow for them to come to you. And, and here's a, you know, a parenting technique. When your child comes to you and is forthcoming, 
even when they do wrong, you know, obviously I'm a big proponent of disciplining and spanking your children, but when a child comes to you and they already tell you, you know, I usually, if I give them the discipline at all, it's very, 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 very light because I want that behavior being able to come to me, you know, and acknowledge, you know, if they've done something wrong or whatever, as opposed to having them be real sneaky with everything and only getting punished when, you know, when dad finds out about it. I'd much rather have them come to me first. So um, you got to be careful in the way you administer you know, a, a punishment or discipline when they're already coming to you. I try not to even, you know, I, oftentimes I won't even do it. Say, hey, you just tell me the truth, you know, you know come to me and, and I won't punish you or I won't punish you severely. Because uh, especially a situation like that, you don't want them withholding because, you know, one abuse is bad enough, but you definitely don't want it to continue. I mean, the, the, the more it happens, the worse it is. Another thing to keep in mind, uh, and this is where I was going with, you know, explaining how we do things here and the way that predators will, will target and groom. And, and, and this is something that I think is important for everybody to understand. You are very comfortable, and especially the longer you come here, the more you get to know everybody, the more comfortable you get in church. And I'm not saying don't to be comfortable, you know, we love each other, but be careful with the way that you, the things you allow even within church. One of the ways that predators will try to get to children again is by exposing themselves to the child, but then pretending like it might be an accident or something like that, right? They're going to look for opportunities to do these things. And the number one place is going to be in the bathroom. We don't have rules on when you can use a bathroom, but you know what? I'll tell you what, parents, it's a good idea not to let your kids just get up in the middle of service when everybody's in here and just go off into the bathrooms by themselves. You may not even be aware if someone else is already in the bathrooms. And I think everyone should be on the lookout. If, someone, if people are just hanging out in that area and in the bathroom area, you know what? Big red flag. Don't do that. And if you don't want to have a red flag over your head, stay away from the bathroom area, <laughs> okay? I don't care who you are. Don't be just hanging around and milling around and just always being, you know, like in the bathrooms or whatever because it's going to look fishy. And, and this is just, this is just, you know what? Keep that for, for what it is in your, in, in your mind because the, the predators, and, and you know what? I don't want everybody here just being, you know, I'm not trying to instill fear in you, but I do want to have good rules in place for you and for your kids for the protection of your family. I would, I would hate to have, especially as a pastor of this church, have anything happen here. And definitely, and at your own home too. So keep up your, just, just have your rules that are going to be in place, not just in church, but anywhere you go. I don't want to see any child defiled. I don't want anybody, you know, establishing relationships in church because maybe a predator comes in here and they realize, well, there's really nothing I'm going to be able to do right here, but then they start making friends with you and trying to get their foot in the door just outside of church. Predators come into churches because it's, an, it's, it's a place where they think they're going to have easy access because people are so trusting. The way that I view everybody, all of you here, is that I don't, I'm not on the lookout, on a witch hunt like I said before, I think only the best of everybody here. You know, I love you. I don't, I'm not thinking in my mind that anybody is a pervert or a predator, right? Unless there's some reason to think that. But, I, you know, I'm not just, just thinking about that. I think everybody's just great. And that's the way I treat people, too. But I'm not going to allow my kids to go off with anybody and be alone with you for any reason not going to happen. Obviously, we have, and, and some of you may know, I'm, this is just popping in my, head, my mind now, but we've had situations where, you know, someone might be allowed to kind of watch the kids while we're close by, but not immediately right there, and everyone's together and no one's being separated. You know, again, use your discernment and your judgment. But the, the point is, you know, we're not, I, I don't look at people like, oh, they're, you know, are you a predator? 
I just have the rules in place where I just say, well, I'm not going to trust anybody with the most precious thing in my life. And I'm not going to assume that there's anything wrong or bad with you. But in order to protect my children, these are the rules I have in place. Does that make sense? I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's a way of, of not like having this really weird relationship with people where you just think like, oh man, everybody, you know, everybody's a bad person. I don't think that way. But it's, at the end of the day, well, here's, here's where our rules are. You can still have great relationships. You can have great friendships. You can hang out together. You could fellowship. You could have the kids can play. You can do all these great things and have great normal relationships and still be able to try to block out anything really, really bad from happening. Because like I said before, if, if I grew up never having a, you know, a sleepover going over to a friend's house, would I really have just turned out just super bad? Yeah, no, of course not. It probably would have been a little bit better for me because those were the, my first opportunities and first exposure to some sinful things that ended up reoccurring in my life. And those types of things, the earlier that, that they're introduced, the more likely it is going to impact you, right, further down the road, and it's going to stay with you. Right. Children get exposed to, there's another thing that predators do is, you know, pornography. Dirty pictures, dirty movies. Hey, look at this. I'm, you know, just be aware. They do these types of things, and the kids need to be aware. You know, if someone does that, kids, if anyone's trying to show you pictures of people who don't have their clothes on or doing things that are just weird and that scare you, tell your parents about it. Tell someone about it. That's not right, and it's not okay, and it's not okay for the person doing that to show you those things. Let someone know about that. It is not right. Flip over to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. We're almost done. We're going to close on 2 Peter chapter 2. It's a parallel passage for Jude. In Jude, we saw these are, you know, we were talking about people who separate themselves. And that's why I wanted to, to just give you that warning. You know, people will, they'll try to separate because then they could do more when they're not under as much scrutiny and under, under the eyes of people around them. Because people who, people who are wicked and people who do wicked things like to do it in secrecy and in darkness and, and you know, away from the eyes of just the light in general and away from everyone else. So watch out for that. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. So again, the predators, they're beasts. The Bible talks about them being beasts, being animals. Made to be taken and destroyed. That's what they're good for. These predators, these perverts, these pedophiles, they ought to just be put to death. That's all they're good for. They're good for lead poisoning. They speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. It's almost identical language to what we saw in Jude. Two warnings here saying the exact same thing. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Again, you're having that normal conversation with somebody and you're talking about godly things. You're talking about, or you're just talking about even whatever, your work and things that, that happen in your life. And these people, they've got eyes that just can't cease from sin. Your mind is just focused on having a normal conversation and these people, they're keeping up their conversation, but in their mind and in their heart and in their eyes, they're just already just, just going forward with, with every manner of sin. Their eyes are adultery. They're looking on people bad and wrong and wicked. This is who these people are. While they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. And this goes to the title of my sermon. 
the unstable souls. They're beguiling, they're deceiving them, they're tricking them, right? The stable soul, think about stability. You're stable, you're ground, you're, you're unmovable, right? That's stability. Unstable, well, unstable soul is going to be easier, swayed. Children are not stable. They're not stable. I mean, just think about when, just at lunch today when my kids were real tired, right? It was nap time. What happens at nap time? A lot of instability. Ah, I wanted that to drink. It was, you know, it's like the worst thing in the world. They're not emotionally stable whatsoever when, it's getting, when they're just starting to get a little bit tired. The stability is just completely out the window. Right? Kids, in general, just, they're not stable. They need to grow. And that's fine, but as parents, the people who are stable need to watch out for the unstable souls because the predators out there are trying to trick the unstable souls. Because a lot of you, I mean, think about kids, you know, you could do the, the most basic of magic tricks, right? You go like, hey, look, see my thumb? Oh, man, whoo! I just, I just took my thumb off. You wanna see that again? Here. <laughs> All right. Kids will fall for that, right? I, I remember being a kid and going like, whoa, my dad showed me that. How did you do that? <laughs> well, here, let me show you again, right? Couldn't figure it out. Because children don't think that way. One, they're not thinking that people are out to deceive them. Right. They're very trusting. Right. A lot of innocence in children. And the predators will take advantage of that. And they're going to beguile, and they're going to trick into gaining, to try to have access, to try to get a kid to trust them even more, to then defile them. These people have eyes full of adultery, these wicked people, these reprobates, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. So you, they have no concept of right and wrong. Whereas you would, would be physically ill to think of a child in the way that these perverts do would probably make you vomit, right? It would make me want to vomit just thinking about it at all, even to let any type of thought cross my mind. These people, that's not there. It's just a matter of if they want to do it or not. That's all. And the Bible's already telling us, well, they already have eyes full of adultery. Who's to say when they're going to get bored with their adulterous thoughts and eyes on, on adults and shift to something else? We don't know, but we know they're out there. It happens way too often. You could read about it practically on a daily basis. Somewhere in the country it's happening. It's going to happen. But we need to make sure it doesn't happen to us and to our family and our loved ones. And let's use the wisdom from the Bible to set up the proper boundaries in our lives to ensure that this doesn't happen. I want you all to, to think about this seriously and set up your own rules and, and, and take it seriously. There's nothing more valuable than your own children in your life. I mean, they are so precious. Love them enough to set up the rules and the boundaries to protect them. And you know what? Sometimes you have to deal with the crying and the complaining of, well, why won't you let me do this? I thank God. You know, I, I said before, I grew up in a worldly home and there were some things that I did that I probably were better off not doing. But I thank God that my parents still had boundaries for me and rules for me. When I was a teenager, when I was in high school, I had a bunch of friends that were going to Cancun, Mexico for spring break. And I threw a fit when my parents wouldn't let me go. Why do you mean I can't, blah, 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 you know? And I put a lot of grief on them as, you know, this, Spoiled teenager, 
not getting his way, throwing a temper tantrum. But you know what? I thank God my parents loved me enough not to give in. Not to just say, oh, okay, well, your friends are all doing this and their parents all said it's okay and just go ahead and do it. Why? Because what happens in Mexico? They're not, they're not, go, look, the, the, the high school kids, all my friends that were going down there, they weren't just going down there to snorkel. That's not why we're going. That's not why I wanted to go. You go down there because in Mexico you could get into the bars and you could go out to these clubs and you could get drunk and you could commit fornication and you could do whatever down there. That's why they're going. And my parents had enough sense to say, no, you're not allowed. Thank God. Don't allow your children to wear you down when it comes to the rules that are important for their safety. I still don't know what it's like to raise teenagers. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> but I was a teenager once and I remember what it's like. I know what it's like. And as parents though, and, and children understand when you have the rules and you think your parents hate you because they don't want you to do anything fun or whatever, or you think you should have more freedom. Look, your parents are looking out for you. They love you. Okay? And, and there is a very good reason, even though you might think, you know, all kids, all teenagers especially think they're invincible. Nothing's ever going to happen to me. No, no, no. You're just worried. No, it's not going to happen to me, Dad. Don't worry about it. Look, we've been there. And, and the world has, there's some really bad people in the world. And... The younger you are, the easier it's going to be for someone to take advantage of you. And that's a fact. Let's keep the things that we treasure most and are most precious to us safe and, and set up these rules and, and make up your own practical rules so that you don't have to worry about your kids being defiled. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for giving us all the warnings that we need, dear God, to, to be aware of the wicked people that exist in this world. God, I pray that you would please just um, give us the wisdom and discernment to know uh, what's right. Well, obviously, we want our children to be able to grow and, and to um, gain more freedom as they get older. But they need to learn. And Lord, I pray that you would please help us to... Uh, be able to, to spot the wolf, spot the predator before they're able to do damage. Lord, watch over our church, protect us, protect our families, dear Lord, and, and help us to be vigilant and make good decisions. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.